Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome. Happy holidays. Uh, happy soon to be the end of the year. Uh, my name is Rita McGrath, and I'm delighted, delighted to be hosting uh, Jay Steinfeld, um, entrepreneurs, entrepreneur, founder of Blinds.com. I mean, I would say a bootstrap bootstrap startup, but I'd say almost a shoelace startup. Um, really one of the good guys. And uh, we're going to be talking about his new book, uh, Growth from the Core, uh, as well as some of the things he's been sharing with business leaders uh, since the book came out and was a fabulous Wall Street Journal bestseller. So let's introduce Jay. It was 2004, and that's when we launched Blinds.com. It's one thing to have a business that's doing okay, but if I wanted to really launch this and make a dent in the blinds business, I needed to learn more. Our keynote speaker today is Jay Steinfeld, founder and CEO of Global Custom Commerce, better known as Blinds.com. Jay is a true Houston entrepreneur here to talk more about accountability. Please welcome Jay Steinfeld to the stage. What are my core values? What I discovered changed the trajectory of my life and all the people in my life. Evolve continuously. Experiment without fear of failure. Express yourself and enjoy the ride. In fact, it was only after understanding these values, the values that drive my behavior, that we began to build a company of significance over time, we, we uh, built it up, we made some acquisitions, and became the, the number one online retailer of blinds in the world, and sold to Home Depot in 2014. I then stayed on for almost seven years and left not to retire, but to rewire in May of this year. Hey, Jay, how are you? Awesome. Thanks for having me, Rita. <laughs> oh, it's such a pleasure. I've been dying to have this conversation since your book made the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Um, yeah. It's been on my list of, of, of go-to uh, resources for people that want to know if it's possible to be a good person and still run a highly successful high growth business. And I think you've proven it can be done. Thank you. Uh, it, it, it's remarkable to, to see that the book has done so well. And so to many people, it's remarkable that you can actually be nice and, and get ahead. Yeah, um, but I think your four values really help shape this fascinating tension, right? Because you wanna be kind and respectful and pleasant to work with, but also, you know, you want to demand high performance. You want people living up to certain standards. You want, you know, <laughs> there are must win competitive battles that you don't just want to give up on. And so there's this fascinating kind of polarity in how you combine all those things. And I wonder if you've reflected at all on, on how those four values help you navigate that. Well, first of all, the, the core values that you just heard about in the real the, the four E's to evolve continuously, experiment without fear, express yourself and enjoy the ride. When you, when you have an organization like that, that is constantly getting better and helping each other get better and taking small chances with uh, manageable risk and giving everybody a voice, you actually accomplish a great deal. How else could this small band of a tiny startup beat Amazon, beat Home Depot, beat Lowe's, beat everybody in the blinds industry without having something as a secret sauce? And it was that we were just able to do things that people thought were near impossible. We even thought they were near impossible, but it didn't mean we weren't going to try. That culture also allowed us to attract people that might have gotten more money from Chevron and Exxon, neighbors in, in Houston where I live. But no, they wanted to be a place where we could do consequential things by first helping people become consequential. And that's the key. I mean, is, is giving people respect too much to ask? I think when you can bring humanity back into the workplace with personal development, respect, and generosity, then you can really accomplish significant things. And that's what people want to be. They want to accomplish significant things. And if you help them first become significant, that can happen. So it just all seemed to have come together. 
And these were not aspirational goals. These are just things that actually drive me. And that happened to then extend to the company. Yeah. And you've been incredibly explicit about it, you know, in your speaking, but in the book, which I'm, I'm so grateful to you. So for those that don't know the book, um, it's a distillation of uh, lots of years of experience, yeah. um, but it also has super helpful you know, checklists and sort of questions to ask yourself and moments of re reflection, which I think are very rich for, for a typical business. I'll call it a memoir. It isn't really a memoir. It's more a distillation of lessons. Um, but just for those of you that don't know Jay, so um, quick recap of the blinds.com story. So you were one of the early entrants into the internet. <laughs> this started as a bit of an experiment. And I love the idea. So Jay had a, and his wife had a, this blind store, right? Which um, was a physical place you could go and buy, buy interior de decor. Um, and when they first went on the internet, the, the, the calls would go to the um, manager at the blind store who would then call Jay, who was inevitably on the road doing something with customers. And he would say, oh yes, I'm the customer service operation for whatever the name right, is. It was, right. it was, it was um, what was the name? It was something brain.com. No brainer blinds. No, no brainer blinds, that's right. Yeah, that uh, was no the brainer first blinds. name because we wanted to make buying blinds and shades a no brainer, keep it simple. <laughs> so they would call into the showroom and they'd say all of our customer service representatives were busy. So they'd call me on the phone and I'd pull off the side of the road in between my appointments. And I'd call them from this giant phone with my order pad on the front desk on the front uh, seat of my car and that's where i would do it for a few years i mean this was not minimum viable product mvp this was hvp hardly viable product it was like nothing <laughs> but it worked and what's fascinating to me is i mean this is in the days of like dial-up internet and yeah. and you know the kind of um um, Wall Street, you know, Wall Street, big, big phone to show you like how evil the guy was. They had this huge like two pound phone that he would use. Exactly. Um, um, and then and then you decided to devote more energy to this. And so opened up a little office with I'm recalling that your staff had to go on down this alley between the blind shop and the office, which rat was a infested alley. Sorry. Yeah. A rat infested alley. <laughs> yes, that was our second office. The first being, of course, my garage. <laughs> As would be, uh, of course, important for all. It's supposed to be that way. But then over the years, you you kind of hit on this rhythm, I'll almost call it, um, using these four values as a way of bringing people with unique talents in and then really leveraging your ideas from them into what became a growth juggernaut. And as you said, you, you'd be. Amazon, you beat Home Depot, you beat Lowe's. You, I mean, you guys nailed it in in the blinds business, and um, I just think it's it's fascinating to see how that. And I think it's the combination, right? So it's the, you know, it's the evolve, which is the the focus on learning, um, the experimentation, which is how do we learn new things in a very disciplined way. And you know, you so you said yourself that you're not a big risk taker, no. and yet when you look at all that your company's done looked at in a certain lens, it could be incredibly risky. I mean, you made a few bet the company kind of moves and stuff, but you would say, no, at any given time, the risk was manageable. Like the risks that we looked at were manageable. And I wonder if you could expand on that because when I talk to people about discovery and discovery driven growth and doing new things, one of the immediate reactions I get is, oh, that's scary. That's uncertain. I can't do that. Well, there's nothing, there is nothing to be scared about when the downside risk is something that you can live with. So every time I made a move, I looked at the downside risk. Even in an acquisition, I'd say, what is the worst that could happen? What if all the assumptions that we made are untrue? Where, what would we be left with? And how much is it costing us for that? And if that was acceptable, I move forward. Mm -hmm. And obviously it, it, everything worked out better than downside risk. But that's how I made all decisions. I never bet the farm. Some, some decisions were very quick and incremental, and most of them were like that. And occasionally you'd made some stair-step moves, but always measured and always asymmetric so that the downside risk was much lower than the upside potential. Right. And the academic phrase that would capture this is thinking in terms of options, right? So I'm going to make a small bet today that buys me access to a big upside, even if I can't guarantee that upside. But if it doesn't work out, I know exactly what I bet, right? And, and exactly. so I can move forward with confidence knowing that. But one of the things I love is how you, like, it's easy for an individual to operate that way, right? I think each of us can decide in our own lives, okay, we're going to do that. It's a 
big transition to get a whole company to operate that way. And so I'd love you to talk about your test tubes. Okay. What, uh, because experimentation without fear is such an important thing. And because what, one of the things we do is try to depict that in multiple ways. Of course, the behavior is the most important. If somebody makes an experiment and it doesn't work, you don't yell at them and you don't say, what the F were you thinking about? You actually just figure out what, what we learned from it and ask questions about how they thought about it. And this way you can learn about uh, how much trust you can put in these people uh, the next time and how you can help them make better decisions. But one of the things we did was we had these two giant test tubes. Each one was about five foot clear glass test tubes. Uh, in one, we put marbles of all the experiments that did not work. And that was full of test tubes, full of marbles. Then next to it was another test tube that had the experiments that did work. And there was not that many in there, maybe 15, 20% full. So that anytime somebody came in, every time people walked past those test tubes, they could see, we do not expect most of our experiments to work. That's the expectation. In fact, not only do we expect it, we're proud of it because we know we'll never really evolve continuously without that experimentation. Because look, if every time you make an experiment, it works or it's working 80, 90% of the time, those are not experiments. Those are just little bitty bets and you're not gonna get very far making very, very tall, small little bets all the time. Yeah. You got to stretch and, yourself all the time. And well, and the evolve continuously. In the in the evolve continuously part, I mean, you really took that seriously. I mean, you put serious muscle behind training, development, absolutely for yourself and for your team. Well, one of the things that I I, I think like, wow, how was I able to do this? Because I'm not in the I'm not that smart. I'm really not. If when I compare myself to all the people in school, I thought, well, th those are the smart kids. But I realized that I just wanted to get better, maybe because I wasn't that smart. Mm -hmm. And I tried harder and I didn't have any money. So I'd have to figure out ways to be resourceful. So it was the lack of, of, of brain power and lack of money that turned out to be strengths for me. And because I knew I couldn't do it by myself, I was able to then get teams. So I developed this probably a superpower of putting emphasis on teams and helping those teams become the best that they could be, the way I was trying to be the best that I could be. But when I really dig down even deeper, I'm realizing that it wasn't just because I wanted to see how good I could become. It was because I was actually fearing death, worried that I would never achieve what I could achieve unless I moved quickly and experimented quickly and helped other people do the same thing. Because in my past, I've had some, uh, my, well, my wife died when she was 47 and my mother when she was 46, both of cancer. So I've got this appreciation for time, but I also know that I need to work fast and I can't, I can't just dilly dally. And I wanna see what I can become as quickly as possible. And because I know I need teams to do it, my appreciation for people became much more heightened to help them become better because together we could achieve things that, well, we would become better than people ever believed possible. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the express purpose of blinds.com. Help That's people cool. become better than they ever believed possible. And you it's have that right on that. It's like not even about achieving. Most companies have like a tagline. That's that's your tagline. It's great. That, that's it. Which, which more than a tagline is actually how we behaved. It's actually how we thought. Yeah. And by becoming better, we could then achieve more than we ever believed possible. It wasn't about the achievement. It was about becoming better. And being better, why would someone leave? We only had 8% turnover. Nobody wanted to leave because we were doing consequential things. We were becoming consequential. We felt good about ourselves and we were supporting each other. But it's also not an environment for everybody because it requires constant evolving. You can never rest on your laurels and not everybody wants that. Mm -hmm. Some people want to just be told what to do. Give me a checklist. I can do it. Mm -hmm. And you need people like that.
But in, in, a, in a startup or in a growing, evolving company, you all have to be builders. And one of the things we did was we looked to hire builders, people who already had those core values within them, not that we brought people with the skill and tried to convert them into our core values. We wanted to know, do you in your personal life already have demonstrated ability to evolve? Are you taking cooking classes? Are you taking flying lessons? Are you learning not to smoke? Anything like that. What do you do? Do you, do you travel someplace with just a backpack and figure out where you're going to go later? Those were all good attributes that we were looking for so that we had less likelihood that they would leave because there's a lot of pressure on people to be self-reliant and to evolve. And if you weren't like that, well, you were going to be ostracized. You were going to be self-selected mm -hmm. out of the company. So we have a question from our listeners. Um, Chris asks, uh, some leaders hire superstars like the New York Yankees and believe this is the way to go. Uh, you know, how do you respond to that? Well, if you can get a superstar, that's great. But normally you can't. They're too expensive. <laughs> uh, we never believed that. I mean, I was not a superstar. I think all the people that became superstars that are now actually running their own companies and have developed uh, uh, key roles in companies, not necessarily in blinds.com anymore, but outside the company. I consider that a huge success. That's not how we all started. And helping people, uh, giving people voice and giving people the opportunity with autonomy and development and clarity of vision well, this How actually brings me to, you know, something that I know you and I have spent a lot of time thinking about, which is this whole notion of, you know, the great resignation. People are basically saying, you know, I'm Johnny Paycheck, <laughs> you know, take this yeah. job in. Um, and, and I think just what I'm sensing is it's not in an angry way as much as it is in a, you know, I've had a couple of years now to reflect. The world has unutterably changed. What am I doing with this precious time that I've been given? And I think you might have some guidance for business leaders trying to figure out, A, why this is going on and B, what they can do about it. Well, why should people stay with you? It's, first of all, it's easy to leave. With technology, if a lot of employers are allowing their workers to work at home, that gives you now with technology the ability to work anywhere. So the door is open, but why would somebody want to leave if they're happy where they are? What are employers doing to keep them there other than money? It, generally, it's always been the case that you have to fairly compensate people. You know, look, I do know that in some jobs, business is so good that they're going to pay anything. People are getting huge raises elsewhere, and there's really nothing you can do. You can be quite an enlightened leader and still lose people over giant increases of money. I understand that. But where is that vision? What are you doing to make it compelling for people to stay? Why are they looking in the first place? I think you, these are just the basics of a business that people have always needed to do. And now it just becomes more uh, incumbent on the leaders to do it. Uh, it's, it's like the internet. When I was doing the internet, I'm thinking, why doesn't everybody buy on the internet? Well, with the pandemic, unfortunately, people started doing it out of necessity. And now they're realizing, why didn't I do this all along? It's so easy. And I think it's the same thing. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've, I've observed with many corporate leaders who, you know, they've been around a while at a certain age and they have a certain mindset around what they I'll call it, oh, their workforce. And I don't mean this in a punitive way. I just mean, you know, how to build a sustainable, energizing, appreciative place of work. And a lot of them are just completely astonished that that's what their people are looking for them to do. And further astonished when people are saying, hang on, I'm not getting that here. Um, because the engagement numbers are desperate. You know, vast numbers of people unengaged, burned out, not having fun at work, you know, not, not enjoying the ride. Um, and, and a lot of leaders not understanding that's part of their absolute responsibility. Well, now maybe they do. <laughs> I, yeah, I maybe. Think, yeah, I, it, it, you just have, you don't have to do it. You don't have to run a business that way. Just because it's working for me doesn't mean that I recommend it for everybody else. Everybody has their own leadership style. 
It has to feel right for you. It has to be true for you. I'm just saying what has worked for me is authentic me. It's the way I want to lead. And therefore, I want to attract people who want to be that way. And it's it's worked, especially in a, in a high growth uh, marketing uh, evolutionary type of business. When I started, it was 1993. Wow, almost 30 years ago online. Nobody knew even what that was. It was a stupid idea. How did we get online? Remember, remember the, the music? Like, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. 1,500 baud modems. <laughs> yeah. it, it, was, it was absolutely insane. And it took about a minute oh, to, yeah. uh, for the computer to boot up. Okay, oh, yeah. and if there were too many other people on the AOL line, right? You had got a busy, you literally got a busy signal getting onto the internet. I talked to younger people about this and they're like, what? Okay. <laughs> you know, as they're staring at their smartphones, they don't understand yeah. this at all. No, and, and uh, images would take 20, 30 seconds to load. Uh, if you could get your homepage to load under 30 seconds, that was pretty good. It's it's completely different. Actually, it was an, it's part of the, people ask me sometimes, uh, did you have any luck? Well, of course I had some luck. Everybody's got some luck. And one of the things that was lucky for me was I started at a time when there was people that didn't even know you could sell things online. So I had some time. I'm not sure that what I did then I could actually do now at the pace that I did it. I'd have to accelerate it much faster today. But back then, everyone thought I was stupid. So nobody put any money into it. And that was luck. Well, and you write in the book that that sometimes when you have a great idea that nobody else believes in, that's actually a signal of you know entrepreneurial brilliance. <laughs> well, you have to have some inside secret, some inside right. knowledge that only you know, so that you can then leverage that idea. Yeah. And if everybody knows it to be true, then everybody's probably already doing it. Yeah, which is one of my big issues with all the, you know, the recent crop of entrepreneurial ventures who all want to be the Uber of fill in blank, right? I mean, like we know that model already and most of it's, you know, easy come, easy go. So Alan from New York wants to know, was radio advertising a test bet? And how did that come about? Oh, we do a lot of radio advertising. Um, and it was really just, again, an experiment. I do remember uh, all hearing people advertise on, on radio host and thinking, God, that must be really expensive. We could never do that. Well, we ended up doing it and it was great. Uh, to advertise using the testimonials of all these radio talk shows. It gets tricky, though, when you're using radio hosts where you don't necessarily believe in what they're actually espousing. Mm -hmm. And that gets very tricky. Mm -hmm. But I'll go off. I, I'm not going to talk about politics right now. But I will say that when we were doing advertising on radio with hosts, uh, it was highly, highly effective for us mm -hmm. because we got to know the host and the host got to know us. Many of them visited us at the office, so knew that what they were telling people was true. Uh, Dave Ramsey, for instance, has been at the office many times and we've been using and having uh, Dave as a, as a radio um, endorser for maybe 10, 15 years, highly effective. He's he's great host. Oh, that's great. So um, we've got just a few minutes left. Let, let's talk about what's next for Jay. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm asking myself that same question right now. With uh, with the book, all sorts of opportunities have have arisen. I'm being asked to speak at universities, companies. They want me to develop entrepreneur uh, learning modules to help their executives be more. Uh, disruptive to have a more expansive mindset, which is, you know, just provide basic entrepreneurial tools. That actually sounds fun. I like that because, look, I'm not in it for the money at this stage. I'm in it to take the lessons that I learned and to give them back. That's the purpose of the book. Well, it was also to help the people at blinds.com learn what made us successful so that I was, as I stepped away, they could use those lessons to continue with those core tenets. But I, I'm not sure. I want to spend a lot of time with my seven grandkids, which are I call my seven startups. And uh, I want to be with family and just do some speaking engagements. And I'd like the entrepreneurial um, uh, mo learning modules. That's going to be good. And whatever I can do 
to to help companies bring humanity back into business, to make it meaningful. I, I just think this is something that people can do if they are just given some structure for doing that. I think you're right. And I think the time really has come. Well, you know, I think we've gone about as far as we can go in the kind of humans as poorly performing robots end of the world. <laughs> and I think we're really ready to rediscover the human potential. Um, Viola's asking a question about engagement, right? And and I think that's really at the core of so much of what keeps a team engaged and enthusiastic. And, and she'd like to know how how we do that. And I think it's every day. You know, it's it's the questions you ask. It's the, the excitement you have. It's acknowledging, right? Um, expressing gratitude. And, uh, and not, for sure. yeah, well, and I think a lot of executives neglect that, you know, not not consciously, but, you know, they don't think about it. It's so it's so fast and so inexpensive to say, you know, what you did yesterday really made my day a lot easier <laughs> or what you did yesterday made a big difference to customer. Why? Or, you know, wow, we just hit one of our major goals for the year. I can't thank you enough. I mean, how hard is that to do? And yet we're so busy thinking about the next thing. A lot of times we really don't just take that moment to realize what an impact that has. And I think something senior people forget is the more senior you are, like the more the ricochets of those things really matter. Absolutely. And I'll say one, one last thing. If you just ask people what they want, just ask, what, what do you want from your career? And even if it's not within your company, if they tell you, look, I want to own my own company one day. If you ask them and they're they're willing to tell you that and you're willing to help them develop to become that CEO or outside the companies do whatever they're wanting to do, the counterintuitive thing about that is they will stay with you longer because you are helping them get there. And if they went out on their own, they'd be stumbling. So if you ask people where, what they want to do, you actually listen and provide development, training, mentoring with, with resources and respect and, and uh, advice, coaching, they're gonna be engaged and they're gonna be glad because they're gonna feel true empathy and true respect from you. And isn't that what we all want? I think that's amazing. So as you and I have talked, one of the challenges companies face in, in implementing all this, right? I, I would call it discovery-driven growth. You and I have talked about for many years now, but how you bring this notion of experimentation and stuff to life. And one of my frustrations is how hard it's been for companies to do this. So one of the things I've been working on is some tools to, to help companies just get faster and better and more confident at, at, at working this way. Like people think, oh, uncertain times, you know, it's undisciplined. It's people in the middle of the night in black t-shirts, you know, eating pizza or whatever it is. That's not yeah. it, right? I mean, not at all. It's a completely different, but very yeah. disciplined way of approaching things. Uh, so one of the things that I'm looking forward to is uh, sharing with you what we're doing over at Belize. Um, and so let's, um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm hoping you're having a great holiday. And I really look forward to seeing the impact you're going to have on the way we do business, not just what we do, but the way we do business, how we lead with these leading from the core four principles. Thank you so much, Jay Steinfeld. Rita, thanks for having me. It's been fun. And now a sneak peek at what we're doing at Valise to try to make some of this easier. Innovation and transformation programs are not working at all well. That is the stark finding from a recent McKinsey study where 94% of executives said their innovation programs are failing to deliver results. And in a related study, 74% said their transformation programs, quote, go nowhere. So what's going wrong? because this is a problem for business. Innovation and transformation strategies are vitally important for growth and success. To get results, companies need to generate and test their ideas. And in a fiercely competitive market, they need to accelerate their ideation and testing. In that process, a lot of ideas will be discarded, but you need a method to identify and capture the most promising ones. You need to know how to incubate those ideas, nurture and grow them for strategic market opportunities. 
But what are the best tools and approaches for doing that? To help address these issues, we have created what we term the Spark Hub system. This is a tool and a learning approach to build effective innovation and transformation capabilities. Spark Hub uses an integrated method to track ideas and identify opportunities. As a subscriber to the Valise program, you will have access to coaching and Ask Me sessions with Rita McGrath and the team at Valise. To find out more about this method of building your innovation and transformation capability, visit valise.com. Thank you, everyone. I wish you a very, very happy holiday and uh, a restful start before 2022 is upon us. Thanks, everyone.